today you're going to say, once again, Kathy, this is not Christmas scripture, but it's about memories, and it's about family, and it's about paying attention to the right things. Our scripture today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. This is Paul writing a letter to Timothy. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted. And I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. This is why I fan, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands upon you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because it was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of, his plain, all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. These are God's words for God's people. Thank God. God. You know, memory is an important thing. Because without it, we might forget who we are and where we came from. I mean, when somebody asks you to introduce yourself, they're usually asking more than your name. They want to know a little bit about you. They want to know, depending on where the introduction is, they might want to know something about your qualifications, right? You're interviewing for a job and you introduce yourself. Well, tell me something about you. If it's a, if you're doing a, an interview with uh, you're, and you want, they want to know about your experience. When you meet people who are pros, you know, prospective friends, you know, what are the things that we have in common? What are our likes and our dislikes? What are the things? Is what this person is asking you in the introduction. And if it's a medical, you know, if it's a medical conversation, then they want to know, okay, where are you broke? Right? What medications are you on? How many of us know this? What medications are you on? <laughs> How long have you been on? <coughs> How you feel? Is there stress in your life? <laughs> All those things. But you know, <clears throat> memories are not just ours, but they're also the people who are attached to our lives. I can tell you more than once, probably quite often, as I sit and I listen to my family recount stories about me when I was little, I'm going like, I don't know who they're talking about, but I'm going to smile and act like I remember those times. And I go, are you sure that was me you're talking about? And they assure me it was. Yeah, I remember some of those things those memories of when I was young. I remember running away from home when I was young, and I remember my brothers who were supposed to be watching me. They dangled one another out of a window and held my piggy bank and lured me back into the house. <laughs> <laughs> Look what we got! <laughs> I remember egg hunts out of the fields of one of my great aunts. And this was the days when you hid real eggs and the, there were the terrace fields. You remember those? And so they would, you would wear your finest Easter garb and you would be out there hunting for eggs in the fields. I remember 
coming home after finally securing my driver's license after the second attempt, <laughs> dropping off the shoulder of the road and spinning the car around 360 degrees with my mother on the other side screaming. <laughs> she knew she had made a mistake. You know, there are things that are significant to me. There are things, there's stories that are significant to us that we tell time and time and time again. And when we share those stories with others, it reminds us who we are, where we came from, what are we about. And this book right here, this Bible, is a story of who we are and whose we are. Before these words were written down in Scripture, they were told for thousands of years from family to family to family. And they were very careful to make certain that they didn't alter the stories because they wanted to stay true to what it was that was being shared about this God that they knew and that they understand and how the, this earth that they understood came into being and who was responsible for it all. They were very intentional about that. And every one of these stories reinforced our identity as believers. All of these stories are part of who we are. This Bible, after it was initially oral tradition, came to be written down. And if you study the Bible at all, you know that there are people who thought they could improve the story a little bit. We can look back on old, old versions of Scripture, and we can see where scribes who were translating said, I don't think they're going to get that, so I'm going to make a little note right here so they'll get it a little bit better. And they, they spent time trying to make sure that things were clear, that in the current times that it made sense even before the King James Version of the Bible, which was the one I was raised on. And I thought that was the way it came when I was a small child, not realizing all the iterations that had come through so far. And even now the one that I use is a little different from that because it's a little more conversational. It's meant to be read aloud, so maybe it will relate more to who we are and how we understand the story. But the fact is, it doesn't matter that the story was told orally. It doesn't matter that there were scribes who tried to help us understand it. Throughout all the transitions of this scripture, one thing is true. It has been striving to tell us of God's great love for us from the very beginning of time. This is striving to tell us who God is and who we are in his story of the world. You know, and, and if you read the stories, you'll know there were times when we did great things. And if we really think of God as our parent, and those of you who are parents know this, there were times when your kids didn't act quite right, huh? Anybody here get a call from the police? <laughs> but this is... <clears throat> God's story about us, about how God had big dreams for us, about how we disappointed him, about how we made mistakes, and yet, regardless of all of the things, God still loves us. And God continues to love us without ceasing in spite of who we are, because God is God. <coughs> and I know in spite, you know, with, with our children, there are times when they have done things we wish they would never have done, and yet I, we still love them with our whole heart because they are our children. And that's how God is with us. But this is the thing that I'm finding, is that the less, of a, the less time we spend in study and in prayer and in reflection, the less we know of who this God is, the less we understand of the story of who we are and whose we are. When our lives are so wrapped up in what I want and what I think, 
then what we find is there's very little room for God to influence our lives. You see, every year in Advent, we strive to remember who God is. That God was one that was not content to leave us to our own devices, but said, okay, if it takes me coming down there, I'll be down there. Because I am not content to allow you to no longer to be estranged from me. And not only am I coming down there, I'm going to show you what true love looks like. You see, Jesus was God with skin on. But because of who he was, he showed us what true love looked like. He showed us what decency. He showed us what justice. He showed us what love. He showed us what caring. He showed us what all these things looked like in the real world in tangible ways. He showed us what it means to love your neighbor. To look beyond what you see on the outside and look deep within and understand that every single person is a valued child of God. And it doesn't matter how hard they live or love, they are still valued. I'm a little upset because I read earlier this week an article that had some news in it from the Barna group, and I don't know if you're familiar with Barna. The Barna is one of those groups that they go out and they collect data on trends, and it's not just, you know, somebody going door to door. It's, it's very scientific. It's very conscientious. This, their data is to be trusted. But it talked about the decline of the church. Y'all, I'm tired of hearing about it. I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired of it. And what they said was how fewer people come to church. And I became angry as I read this article. Because what they were doing is they were telling us their conclusion is that culture is influencing the church. Culture is influencing we as Christians, more than the Bible is. And I don't know about y'all, but that kind of makes me mad. I don't like that. The media and political climate around us is driven by anger, by anger and hate, and that's what's being brought into the church as we break into camps about who was right and who was wrong, and statements of if you believe that this party you can't be Christian, and if you believe that that party you can't be Christian, it's enough. And I haven't heard that so much here at Chapel Wood, I will tell you that. I hear here a very different tone. I hear a heart that is sort of grieving about what they see in the state of the church, and yet I see a heart and I hear a heart of a people that want to make a difference in this community, make a difference in Athens, and I'm going to tell y'all, that is so refreshing. And I'm not saying we shouldn't grieve those who have gone before and, and how things have changed, but if we spend all of our time at looking at what was, how will we ever live into what it is and, and adopt a God-sized vision of what it is that we are supposed to be? You know, when we spend our time looking about what was, when we spend our time fighting what and participating in Christians who fight against each other, we are negating, we are ignoring the cradle and we are negating the cross. And friends, that's not right. And when we find ourselves in those places, we need to be willing to stand up and speak truth. We need to be willing to stand up and say, you know, the cross 
was a bridge of a chasm to show us what love looks like, willing to give everything in spite of being killed. The season of Advent is about expectation. It's about waiting. About that feeling that something is about to change. The what if in the world. So here's my question. What if the thing that is supposed to change is you and me? What if that is what we are to be anticipating when we ask God, Lord, you brought this gift of Advent into my life. Can you transform me into the person that has the God-sized vision to make a difference right where I am, to become the person that God has created you to be? See, I think the real challenge, because we've listened so much to the world, the real challenge is to take our eyes off of ourselves and to look out. To look out. Look into the community around us. You see, I don't want the church to be a memory what society tells me it is. I want the church to be a force to transform the world the way it used to do it. But I don't want to be looking back. I want to be listening and I want to be seeing what it is that God has called us to be in this time and place. And the only way we can do that, y'all, I'm going to tell you straight up, the only way we can do this is we're going to have to be willing to spend some time in prayer. Individual and collective prayer. We're going to have to be willing to spend some time in study, in Bible studies. We're going to have to be willing to spend some time in groups and say, you know, what is it? And how is it that God is calling us to live? We're going to have to spend some time saying, you know what, that might be a good idea, but that's not where I need to be right now. I need to be right here, growing and nurturing my soul. So in 2022, we're going to be having small groups, and we're going to be having Bible studies. And I'm going to invite you, if you have a group of people and you want to bring them into your home and you want to do a study, let me know, because i got resources, baby. <laughs> I want us to become and live into, we have a great reputation. We have, there are great memories about what Chapel Wood has done in Athens. Johnny comes in and he Johnny comes in and tells me stories about the ways that we have made a difference, and absolutely I believe it. And I've heard stories about great uh, yard sales and all kinds of things. But the stories I want us to be creating is like, wow, you see that church over there? They may be small, but they're mighty. You see that church over there? I'm not sure what's going on, but I really like how they're doing things. Because they're invested in the community. You see that church over there? There's something about those people. A different way that they approach life. A different way. They seem to have something within them that gives them a spirit of giving and a joy within them that in spite of everything around them that seems to be going on, they are, there's something about them and I want to know So we're not going to worry about numbers, y'all. Because if God has promised us, if we do the work, he will grant the increase. And the increase isn't about us. The increase is about God and God's work. And that's who we're going to be. So I'm challenging you, eat all that sugar and stuff now. <laughs> Get it out of your system. Because we're going to be going for meat in January. We're going to be stepping up. I've got a 365-day Bible study for you. Aren't you happy? <laughs> Do it at your own pace. Do it when it works for you. But you'll be able to look at it on your phone or on your computer or whatever or just listen to it if that's what you want to do. 
10 minutes a day. I'm asking you for 10 minutes a day to focus on God. And how will God multiply that 10 minutes a day to transform not only our lives, but the, the life of this church as well? Would you pray with me? God, you are the God of all, of all. You're the God of love, the God of strength. You are the intimate that we anticipate each year at Christmas time. Lord, we are part of your story. And we want to continue to be part of your story, Lord. We want to look into what it is you would have us be. So ready our hearts, ready our minds. Help us to embrace how you would have us live. Give us your eyes to see and your ears to hear and clarify our vision beyond what we think we can do to what it is you have called us to do. And may we be the church here that works in your name to love our neighbor, and to make a difference. Build a passion within us to be your people in this time and place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat>